your eyes under their oh, come on that would make a great sermon <laughs> But we're going to go with John chapter 16, verses 13. John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus said, When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare it to you that things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. In that very brief pericope there, we have the Spirit, Jesus, and the Father. It's the Trinity, and this is Trinity Sunday. And Father Chris made a bold promise two weeks ago that I was going to explain the Trinity <laughs> to all of you. All right. So, and, oops, I lost it. Come back here. Let's see. Share screen. There we go. Share screen. Okay. There you go. There's the Trinity. That's the perfect explanation of the Trinity. See, you have God, and God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Father is not the Son, the Son's not the Holy Spirit. Each of them glorifies the other. Ta da! I have explained the Holy Trinity. There you go. There you go. There you go. All right. But I do want to give you the definitive definition of the Holy Trinity. Is that a redundancy? Definitive I think, definition. I think, so. I think that's a, okay. Redundancy. All right, whatever. But I need you to fill in the blank. All right. God is, who said, love. Amen. That's it. God is love. All right. And the Holy Trinity is the perfect love relationship. Each person of the Trinity loving the other so completely that the three become one. It's, you know, it's what is promised about marriage. A man shall leave his father and mother and they will, they will be united and the two shall become one, right? It's the same, the Trinity, the three become one by the love relationship that they have. But that love relationship just oozes out, pours out from him. And so the Holy Trinity is, in that sense, an invitation to love for all who turn to him. Look, if you will, please, at John chapter 4. I'm sorry, the first epistle of John chapter 4. The first epistle of John chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. Father Chris, could I ask you to bring my water over here? Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. The first epistle of John, chapter 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because... God is love. There you go. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So we have God the Father sending the son to bring his love to the world. Verse 10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he is in us because, why? He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. 
If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. My friends, that's the definitive definition of the Holy Trinity. You can write all the diagrams you want, but it comes down to the love relationship that God has within either the different persons of the Trinity, but with all who profess him and who are walking in his light. What God is, God is love. What God is, is what God does. He is love and he loves us and he's calling us to love one another. Let me give you a little bit of background about the Feast of the Holy Trinity. Trinity is a feast day, dates only to about the ninth century, and it was observed sporadically until the 14th century, and then it was added to the Roman calendar in 1316. But the Feast of the Holy Trinity is observed by every major denomination in the Christian church. <coughs> Why is that? It's because the Trinity is the, emphasize one, established dogma of the Christian church. It is the one statement of what we believe about God, that he is three persons in one substance. Now that comes to us through the Nicene Creed. But before we get to the Nicene Creed, I wanna tell you about another creed. Because in many churches around the world today, it is required that they say the Athanasian Creed. All right. Say that again. Bring a sack <laughs> There you go. Uh, let me show you the Athanasian Creed. All right. This is the Creed of St. Athanasius. And be, be glad you are not, uh, you were not born in a hundred years ago in the uh, in England and had to be a member of the Church of England because you were required to memorize this in order to be confirmed. Okay, this is the Creed of St. Athanasius, which Athanasius didn't write this, by the way, because it didn't exist before about the fifth century, and Athanasius died in the fourth century. So, anyway, but so who, whosoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled without doubt, he shall perish everlastingly. What a cheerful way to begin. What a way to begin. Yeah, and it goes downhill from there. No, anyway, <laughs> but this is a very detailed, watch this. This is a very detailed explanation of the Trinity. There's one person of the Father, another of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and so forth. And it keeps going. And yet they are not three gods, but one God. And it keeps going. And so likewise, the Father is the Lord, the Son, the Holy Ghost, Lord, et cetera, et cetera. It keeps going. Okay. And then we get into the incarnation, the doctrine of the incarnation. Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe rightly the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then that keeps going. He's perfect God, perfect man, so forth, so on. Anyway, and then you finally come to, and this is the Catholic faith which except a man believe faithfully, he cannot be saved. Okay? Now, I have a little <clears throat> bit of problem with that. Let's go with the apostle. All right. Our salvation has never, nor will it ever, be found in a doctrine. Our, our salvation is found in a person, and it is in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I told you about that the Nicene Creed was decided on by the church in a, in a council, actually two councils, the Creed of, I mean, the uh, Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople. And technically, the name of the Nicene Creed is the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. I'm glad they shortened it. <laughs> okay, but that is the, the statement of faith of the church from the councils about what we believe about the Trinity, 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We'll be saying that in just a few minutes, and so you'll see it. However, there was a council that predated all of those councils, and it was the Council of Jerusalem. The Council of Jerusalem is found in your Bible in chapter 15 of the Acts, okay? You can read it. You can read all about that council. And in that council, the church said this in Acts chapter 15, verse 11, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved. It is by the grace of Jesus that we are saved, not by being able to wrote, recite the Athanasian Creed. Okay, that's it is not true. All right, kind of reminded me of Father David last week. Those who require the Athanasian Creed as a statement of faith and a proof of their salvation are the decaffeinated church. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> and those who believe in the power of the Holy Spirit and the glory of God and that Jesus Christ is their salvation, they're the caffeinated ones. They do a lot of clapping too, but that's another thing. Anyway, but here we are. The Nicene Creed was established at the Council of Nicaea and Constantinople. And it begins with these two words, we believe, okay? We believe, the word believe literally means to knit your heart. We knit our hearts to the Father. We knit our hearts to the Son, Jesus Christ. We knit our hearts to the Holy Spirit. We knit our hearts to the one who is love. And in scripture, we are exhorted to take that love and to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we can only do that. We can only love God and love our neighbors as ourselves when our hearts are knit to the one who is love itself. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, John says, we love because he first loved us. You can't love without the love of God. Now, as an alternative to the creed of St. Athanasius, let me suggest another thing. And that is the breastplate of St. Patrick. Casey said she uses that prayer in the morning. It's a wonderful prayer. And I'm going to share it with you. All right. St. Patrick's Breastplate. Actually, you heard a little hint of that this morning. Father Chris read that at the beginning of the service. And this is a, I, I was talking to Susan yesterday about this. This is a wonderful hymn. Very difficult to play. It's got all sorts of different meters and it changes in the middle and all that sort of stuff. But it, this, actually, I had this at my ordination and just hit me. On Tuesday, I will be celebrating 39 years as a priest in the church. Oh, I can't be that old. We should be singing this. Oh, well, <laughs> we didn't put it on. What's that? There you go. That's right. My son's 39. Therefore, I must be a priest of 39 years. All right. I bind into myself today the strong name of the Trinity. That's it. That's that knitting. I bind myself. I bind unto myself this day the glorious name of the Trinity by invocation of that name, the three in one and the one in three. And then it goes on. I'm going to just highlight this for you, okay? I bind this day to me forever by power of faith, Christ's incarnation, his baptism, his death, his bursting from the tomb, his riding up the heavenly way, his coming at the day of doom. I bind unto myself. Jesus Christ. By the way, you get the idea of the breastplate. Uh, another name for the St. Patrick's bless, breast, little breastplate is Lorica. A Lorica was, um, it's a Roman, uh, it's a Roman um, garment that they wore in battle to protect them from uh, <laughs> sword swipes or arrows. Heavy leather that went over the heart and it's to protect the heart. 
And when you think about that, that's what this is. We're praying for God's protection upon our hearts, that our hearts may continue to be bound to God. I bind unto myself the power of the great love of the cherubim. I bind unto myself today the virtues of the starlit heaven. And I bind unto myself today the power of God to hold and lead, his eye to watch, his might to stay, his ear to hearken to my need, the wisdom of my God to teach, his hand to guide, his shield to ward, the word of God to give me speech, his heavenly host to be my guard. And then it goes into this, this is where one of those changes is for the musicians, sorry about that, but Christ be with me, Christ within me. It's a great way to sing though. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me. It goes on, Christ beneath me, etc. And then it comes back to the other tomb. I bind unto myself today. I bind unto myself the name, the strong name of the Trinity, by invocation of the same, the three in one, one in three, of whom all nature hath creation, eternal Father, Spirit, Word, praise to the Lord of my salvation. And then here it is, the key, salvation is of Christ the Lord. There you go. And I've lost my cursor. Where are you? There you are. Okay. No, it's not. No, it's not. That you'll see it sometimes on the shield of, of St. Patrick, those words. But the whole thing is called the breastplate. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that to me is a much more sufficient statement about the Trinity. Because the Trinity is not just an, an abstract doctrine out there that we pay intellectual assent to. The Trinity is the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he it is who we worship. He it is who gives us life. He it is who gives us his love that we may love him and love one another. It is important for us to understand that relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For that's how God loves us. He loves us as a father. He loves us through his son who was incarnate and came and made his dwelling with us. He loves us through the Holy Spirit who gives us life and power and caffeine and <laughs> whatever. So my question to you is, is it important to fully explain and understand the Trinity, Father Chris? <laughs> <laughs> or is it important to fully live life in the Trinity? Yes, yes there you yes. go. Good answer, Father Chris. <laughs> the Holy Trinity, my friends, is an invitation to love. God the Father loves us. God the Son loves us. God the Holy Spirit loves us. And he draws us into that love, which is him. And fills us with himself. For God is love. We love because he first loved us. What God is, that is what God does. So let us bind unto ourselves today the strong name of the Trinity. Amen. Amen.